American Cult Christianity, Part 14. Why are there so many strange American cults today? The Assault on the Gospel Essential of Justification by Faith Alone. Hello, this is Joe Franklin again of SparrowMinistry.com. This is a continuation of my new YouTube series on American cults and their beginnings. This ongoing and vital series, called American Cult Christianity, asks the question, why are there so many strange American cults today? Again, the short answer is the assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. This aspect of our salvation and foundational gospel truth is the number one target of the enemy and has been ever since the church began on the day of Pentecost. We have been learning about a number of non-Christian cults and cults of Christianity that were birthed during the Second Great Awakening in 19th century frontier America. All of these groups still infect the Christian church today, with far too many Christians being unable to understand just what is it that makes these groups unorthodox. Well, let's find out. Disclaimer here, and a full disclaimer is on the website. Uh, this YouTube channel is dedicated to the study of controversial groups and movements, some that have been called quotes. Uh, excuse me, cults. <laughs> cults in quotes. <laughs> okay. All right, so here we go. Buckle up. So justified from past sins only, the limited atonement heresy. Okay, so top to bottom. Stated eloquently by Caspar Olivianus. Quote, salvation is by grace alone, or Jesus is but half a savior. End of quote. I like that one. That's a good one. And uh, let's see. Okay, the next is the gospel of the cults. Adherents are in some sense contributing or supplementing Christ's redeeming work, his work for us. Next is their works of obedience. Relieve them of the burden of their guilt. Next, biblical faith is the opposite of this kind of self-sufficiency thinking that we can add to or contribute to Christ's finished work, thinking that uh, some effort on our part is needed for salvation. Biblical faith is the opposite of that kind of self-sufficiency. And finally, the biblical gospel teaches us to trust in the all-sufficient grace of God in Christ alone plus nothing. Some comments. And as I as I have stated throughout this series, justification is a one-time blessing and therefore cannot be decoupled or extracted from the cross. Justification is grounded in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, with our security and assurance of salvation being fixed and immovable. Justification is not an event and a process. It is a forensic legal act. Isaiah 53, verse 11, Romans chapter 3, verse 24, Romans chapter 5, verses, verse 9 and 19. The cross work of Christ and his death on the cross secures this because Christ, by his suffering and substitutionary atonement, substituted his perfect obedience for our disobedience and endured the punishment that our sins deserve. Christ has earned a perfect righteousness and innocence for us, a righteousness that is ours through faith. So much so that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. This grace comes to us at Christ's expense. This is what his shed blood accomplished. No works are the ground for our justification. But hidden and overt pride won't accept Christ's work as being the ground for our justification. Uh-uh-uh. The passions, appetites, and impulses of the sinful nature seek satisfaction with anything 
but God's merciful provision in Christ. Casting aside a trusting faith, we begin using our own resources by trying to be Christ-like in our own strength. Little elbow grease here. This sinful nature prefers to find something within ourselves in which to boast and take credit for our holiness. We begin looking to men, their unique and novel teachings, and to systems of men who have organized a moral code for us to, to adhere to. <clears throat> Excuse me. We swing towards legalism or licentiousness as we try to fill that emptiness, that lack of fulfillment in our lives. Maybe we don't understand how to walk by the Spirit. Although God's work says a Christian must put to death the religious pride that resists God's grace, we begin to think that God is actually cooperating with our plan to supplement some of our acts of righteousness alongside his atonement, thereby lifting our works above the cross. But works righteousness is offensive to God, and it mocks the cross and devalues the atonement. We become like little gods to ourselves in terms of God's will for our holiness, if we insist on a righteousness through our own efforts, apart from complete trust in the cross of Christ. Okay. This lesson looks at all the preconditions and, qualify, and qualifications the cults front load into the gospel. These, pre these prerequisites to salvation mock the cross, make salvation man-centered, and contradict any claim the cults make about believing in full atonement. Okay, we're over in Vegas here. I guess we've got the shell game going here. Cults deny the finished work of Christ and imputation. Adherents have no assurance. So a good reference point is Romans 5, 18 and 19. Sums it up well. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as though, just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Next is, it is because of justification that the peace of God can rule in our lives. It is because of justification that believers can have assurance of salvation. And that's uh, gotquestions.org. Great website. Next is cults do not believe Christ's atonement was sufficient. They'll say, oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. But we've got a dozen prerequisites to salvation and on and on. OK, next is Jesus is simply never enough for them. They erect a little cross next to Jesus's cross. Next, cults confuse the who with the do. Never do that. You shouldn't. You'll be confused. They reject eternal security. And finally, it is not God's will for his children to be insecure about their salvation or identity, who they are in Christ. Those two promises or gifts are fixed and immovable. We must persevere, but not under the heavy weight of conditionalism. So again, some groups claim they believe in full atonement, but contradict that with their conditionalism sales pitch. Listen to what people say, but then watch what they do. Test the spirits. Some cults don't deny full and finished atonement or imputation, but either omit them from being taught or muddy the water to the point where Christ's blessings cannot be experienced. I know if you're in the ICOC, you know that they deny original sin, so they don't look at Romans 5, 18 through 19 as Adam's sin being imputed to us. So therefore, guess what? Flip side of that, <laughs> you can't have Christ's righteousness imputed to you. So you're going to have to save yourself. Good luck with that one. All righty, let me see if we've covered everything we have. 
Oh, ooh, okay. All right, um, we've got some dirty water here. So the outworking of your justification is sanctification. So justification will bloom into your sanctification. You get it wrong on justification, you're going to get it wrong on sanctification. So, And here we have uh, that image. I like that image. So let's look at a quote here from Got Questions and then... Um, will continue on. It is the fact of justification that enables God to begin the process of sanctification, the process by which God makes us in reality what we already are positionally. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. And uh, that's gotquestions.org, as I said. Uh, the cults do not believe or teach Romans 3, 4, and 5 correctly. They can't because they wouldn't be able to take you captive with all of their works righteousness scheme and all the conditionalism. So next is, next bullet, bullet point down, people are faithful to what they have been baptized into. You'll hear that a lot in the cults, um, especially Church of Christ and International Churches of Christ. Those who place weight on some works of obedience in obtaining salvation, baptism, Sabbath keeping, a bunch of Bible studies and other kinds of stuff, well, they'll be shackled to those works until death after. So it's like gum on your shoe. It follows you around wherever you go. That strand of performance and work salvation will, from cradle to grave, will follow the cultist wherever they go. It's like white on rice. Um, finally, last bullet point, Paul called this arrangement another heteros gospel and slavery. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Galatians 2, verses 4, and Romans chapter 6, verses 16. This is demonic oppression I'm talking about and a false gospel. Some comments, the downstream effect of having your works tied to righteousness and salvation will leave you with little peace and no eternal security. You know, imagine somebody upstream from you, you're out camping, camping and they're just doing all kinds of stuff and washing their clothes in the water and dumping all their coffee grounds in there and stuff, and you're a couple hundred yards downstream. Well, how's that gonna work out? Little peace and no eternal security. You will also be living a life, and again, that's Romans 5, therefore, and Romans 5, 1 through 11, a big argument for eternal security, and there are many other passages. But anyhow, you'll be living a life in the flesh which cannot please God. Romans 8, 7 and 8, Galatians 5, 16 through 18, and verse 24. Works are the inevitable result of justification and imputation, but they don't save us or keep us saved. They are more appropriate for reward in heaven. Rewards in heaven. Again, this justification is entirely forensic, meaning that it is an act of acquittal. A courtroom setting is in view here, and it's not a transformation of the person as he or she does good works. This is the heretical Roman Catholic view on justification. That's righteousness. Justification is infused or imparted as we perform good deeds. The Apostle Paul uses the language of imputation or crediting when describing justification in Bible texts. Okay, so here we go. The pietists of the restoration movement tie works to salvation. I believe this was in lesson or part six, but it's worth repeating, okay? Cults redefine the biblical understanding of our union with Christ and all the blessings therein. Those blessings would include calling, regeneration, adoption, justification, sanctification, and perseverance. At one point, I had a... a uh, image on there called the salvation diamond. Well, all of that is askew in the cults as they add their performance to what it takes to um, achieve uh, the new life. Certain religious observances and the completion of various religious behavior patterns 
are the basis of God's approval in the cults. Certain religious observances and the completion of various religious behavior patterns are the basis of God's approval. Should be really are not, but it's are. Okay. During sanctification, the individual embarks on a scheme that offers obedience as the basis of why they are right with God. Paul addressed this in Galatians 5.4. And here's our virus alert. And it's a biggie. Salvation by work scheme. Conditionalism. Eh, 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 eh. Next is the lie. Our acts of obedience are part of the ground by which God accepts us. By which we're justified. Right? Justification is God is accepting us. Mm -mm -mm. Part three, we learned about that. And... Lost in space. Danger, Will Robinson. Will Penny. Okay. So some comments on this. Um, the cult's not understanding the relationship between works and salvation. <laughs> Always running to James chapter 2, by the way, to prove their point and taking that out of context. But that's a topic for a different time. Comments. The new religious movements coming out of the 19th century frontier America are doing something quite foolish. They are attempting to be saved in part by what they do, especially their many acts of obedience. They're in love with their own obedience. They brag about it, boast about it, argue over it. Don't talk much about grace or the Holy Spirit, though. Israel tried this and look where it got them. Romans 10 one through four. Their indoctrination always employs false definitions. Those caught up in their web of false beliefs and false ideas about God and his word do not know it. They believe they have been taught the gospel truth. They believe this is what the Bible actually teaches. Remember all, remember, all restoration movement cults and cults of restorationism believe they are the one true church and that everyone living the Christian life outside their restoration group is lost and going to hell. By improperly linking the completion of certain works as being necessary to obtain the new life, they are making it impossible not to trust in performance and works as being somehow salvific in nature. Harmful and abusive pietism ties works to salvation, thus distorting the gospel. Protestant Reformation writers have correctly said, we serve because we are saved and not in order to be saved. And John Piper, whom I've quoted often, said it differently, quote, it's that he's for me totally that enables me to obey. Not that, I, not that I obey that makes him totally for me. We have to preserve that for the sake of the world, for the sake of the church, and for the sake of the gospel. End of quote. John Piper, and that's him on the doctrine of justification and imputed righteousness. The Bible says that no works are the ground of our justification. Obedience is important, but doing so does not force God to approve of you or me any more than when you or I first believed and were completely, once for all, justified and holy in his sight. Okay, I may have shown this slide before, but it's worth repeating. The Restoration Movement Gospel To-Do List for Salvation. Not listing the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, uh, Latter-day Saints. Those are non-Christian cults. I want to hit the, the cults of Christianity here. Oh, wait, the Mormons are there. Never mind. So we got the Mormons. Next will be the Restorationists. That's the Stone Campbell Scott Churches of Christ. And then we've got a modern day group, the International Churches of Christ, of which I was a part of. Um, and let me see here. Okay, let me just go ahead and look this over. Okay, so we have this, the restoration list for salvation. So here we've got a portrait of uh, the uh, Campbell, Stone, and Scott there. And they first came up with this, uh, the, the gospel. They said, well, we, we made an ancient gospel discovery. 
uh, five finger plan of salvation that came with it. It was first implemented. So uh, Campbell discovered the gospel, he said, in uh, 1823. Four years later, his evangelist, Walter Scott, put this five finger ancient gospel uh, plan of salvation uh, formula into practice and it, it caught on. It was first implemented in 1827. So um, those are the Campbellites. Okay, so let's go through some of these uh, to-do lists for salvation. Mormons, the Mormon gospel. Now this is for salvation. This is not for after salvation. This is to get saved and to stay saved. Okay, the Mormon gospel. Belief plus repentance plus laying on of hands plus temple work, plus mission work, plus church ministry, plus tithing, plus ceasing from sin, plus confessing Joseph Smith as prophet, plus temple marriage, plus baptism for the dead. The list could go on and on. And that's from gotquestions.org. This next is from Bob Ross, uh, Church of Christ um, critic, uh, theologian, and just a great uh, debater. The Restorationist Plan of Salvation, again, uh, 1811, the Restorationist said, that, hey, geez, we restored the church for the first time. It fell asleep for 1,800 years, and we, <laughs> we found it. And then Campbell uh, said, well, geez, uh, hey, now I've also found an ancient gospel discovery in, uh, discovery in 1823, and then they're off to the races. So anyhow, the restorationist plan of salvation, which if you will obey, they talk over and over and over again about their obedience. They're in love with themselves and their own obedience. <laughs> anyhow, if you obey this, you'll be saved in heaven after this life is here plus belief plus repentance, plus confession, plus baptism, plus local congregation, plus Lord's Supper on the first day, plus giving on the first day, plus singing, non-instrumental, get rid of that piano, plus prayer, plus benevolence, plus Bible study, plus no creed, plus Bible name, plus second law of pardon, plus obedience to elders, <sighs> plus good morals, plus no Christians in other denominations, plus scriptural marriage, if married, plus whatever the evangelists preach as the word of God. Bob L. Ross. Okay, that's very interesting and very true. Okay, the next one is the ICOC. This modern-day Campbellite sect began in 1979. It's known as the International Church of Christ. This group's doctrines include baptismal remission and conditional salvation that eclipses the legalism of their spiritual birth church. Sheesh, <laughs> how do you do that? Well, they found a way. Steps to ob obtain salvation include here, plus believe, plus complete eight to 10 Bible studies, full of false dilemmas, incremental disclosure and manipulation, plus disciples repentance, plus confess, plus make Jesus Lord, plus disciples baptism, plus agree to have a babysitter, that's a discipler they call, plus agree to confess all temptation and sin to them for accountability and training, <laughs> plus follow all the dating rules, plus never question leadership, plus protect the sect at all costs, uh, number one rule there, plus submit to badgering and coercion from per for percentage giving of money, they love their special contributions and all these things, plus promote one true church, plus prideful elitism. And that's from yours truly, your humble correspondent here, Joe Franklin, that's me. Okay, some comments. And that's a little picture of Kit McKean there. He's already raced off and started another cult uh, in 2006. He started a group called the International Christian Church, or SODM, Sodom, the Sold Out Discipling Movement. So, some comments. And let me make sure I'm on the right slide. I am. Okay, the heretical restorationism cults, such as the Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Christadelphians have a similar merit badge list for salvation as well. So I'm not going to cover all those. <laughs> it would just get into be too long. 
the fabric and continual strand. And that's why I chose the backdrop to this slide. It looks like some kind of fabric in the background. So the fabric and continual strand that takes them to heaven are their attempts to be saved in part by what they do. Works. But salvation and sanctification are grounded in grace with works being the inevitable result of a transformed life. God doesn't need my works and he doesn't need your works. Okay, so the finished work of Christ, the old rugged cross, it always comes down to that, doesn't it? So when we are saved, sins are forgiven past, present, and future. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14 and elsewhere. Okay, so here's a great quote from thelife.com. It looks like from Lauren Berg, and I've mentioned and included this uh, slide before too. Quote, the perfection that comes from Jesus' sacrifice has no end, even though those who have been made perfect are still in the process of being made holy. What makes us perfect is not what we do, but what Jesus did on our behalf. His infinite perfection cannot be stained by our imperfections. I think of the stained water of that slide just a minute ago. If we have put our trust in Jesus' death to pay the penalty for sin, we can be confident that sins from our past, our present, and our future are forgiven all because of the perfection of Jesus' sacrifice. Lauren Berg. Alrighty, and so here's uh, some comments. Christ's work of atonement was fully completed at the cross. John chapter 19, verse 30. It is, it's a completed action and a done deal. Hebrews 9, 26, and again, 10, 11 through 14. Jesus obeyed perfectly every single part of the law, and by faith, the Christian places full weight and trust in that completed work. Christ then took his seat at the Father's right hand. Restoration movement groups enslave and scare their members by teaching that Jesus' blood sacrifice forgives and cleanses us from past sins only. One can fall in and out of salvation or an approved status with God based upon adherence to the moral code set before them by church leadership. This is called yo-yo Christianity. The Church of Christ has their first and second law of pardon, and the International Church of Christ has all their restoration Bible studies for anyone leaving their one true church and then coming back and wanting back in, or simply just for anyone falling into any kind of sin. Well, we got to restore you. We got to take you through this second law of pardon. Okay. The Seventh-day Adventists have their heretical investigative judgment doctrine where Christ has some kind of holy abacus up there as he tallies all their good deeds and counts up all their sins. No thanks. I'm going to trust in scripture and I'm going to trust in the authentic Christ and his all-sufficient work. The Bible response. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, will you find justification as a process. Justification, again, is a fancy word for salvation. It's not a process. This not guilty but righteous blessing, justification, comes to us freely by faith alone, Romans 3.28, and it is always depicted as a one-time event, no yo-yo. Roman Romans 5.1 says, therefore, having been justified through faith, in other words, this grace is a past event, God's work for us. It's a done deal. Sanctification, however, is a process of being made into the image of Christ. That is God's work in us. This process will continue until one is taken home by rapture or death. Okay, so this is really important. This is also a repeat slide with a slightly different emphasis, but it's worth repeating. Cults put sanctification before justification. And I'm going to read what's on the left here. 
Jesus explains salvation, and that's that dark gray ribbon. Jesus explains salvation. It's relational, covenantal salvation. Abraham, remember, he believed God, trusted God, and God credited to him as righteousness. That's the covenant. That's covenantal salvation and not a transactional salvation. It's not Old Testament thinking, this for that, equitable exchange model. No. And then the blue cloud, this is what saves and this is what does not save. That's discernment and cult prevention 101. There's that missing puzzle piece. <laughs> it's this, this is it. I mean, if you can take a hold of this and ask the Holy Spirit, if you're in one of these cults, this is a great time to really pray to the Spirit and ask for discernment. Okay, so at the top there, we've got a review slide, part four. Cults. Jesus is but one half a savior. They confuse justification with sanctification, front-loading and back-loading the gospel with works. So let's just take the front-loading part. And um, so here we have a really clear example. This is from Dr. Robert Moray, Rise of the Cults YouTube video. I simply took this and put it on a table and put it in the slide. This is Dr. Robert Moray. 35 plus years of scholarly teaching, an expert in apologetics, and a very uh, well, uh, you know, received author. Before salvation, stuff is directed to the lost. That's justification, conversion, we repent and believe. Acts 20, 21, and Mark 1, 15. But then you'll see some red arrows, and I marked them red for a reason. They should not be there. It should simply be that that person has been saved, they've been responded to the gospel, they've surrendered to Christ. At the moment they exercised saving faith, the Holy Spirit regenerated them and they were added to the kingdom of God as children of God with full rights. Okay. After salvation, that's the stuff directed to someone who's saved, who's already received the Holy Spirit fully indwelt and received all the blessings of salvation. The cults will take that, which is directed to the saved, and front load, it, front load it saying, listen, you need that even if you're still lost, you still need to do that. And part of what they do is they take James 2, 14 through 24 out of context. Next, after salvation, well, it's sanctification. And the cults say, listen, I'm going to take that red line. I'm going to move that right past the firewall. And I'm going to move sanctification right up there that you need to do that in order to be justified. They'll take the Christian life. That's showing the fruit of faith and repentance, right? And they'll move and front load that right over into conversion. Hey, you need to show the Christian life in order to be converted. And then baptism, of course, is... Uh, they will move that front there, front and center, and say, hey, listen, baptism is a prerequisite for salvation. Repenting and believing, surrendering to Christ, receiving Christ, giving your life to Christ, none of that counts. You're still lost and going to hell. You have to be baptized, and you have to be baptized in one of our restoration movement groups, by the way, in order to get your sins forgiven. But that's done after salvation in the Bible. Now, Lord's Supper, none of the restoration movement groups that I know of will allow the Lord's Supper before somebody gets saved. So in that sense, that, that's a little off there. But offerings, gifts, domestic duties, basically, I don't know how much of that is required before salvation, but I think you get the picture. Some comments here. One of the hallmarks of the cults of Christianity is that they confuse justification with sanctification. These are separate things. Yes, they're related, but they're separate, and we must keep them separate. Those red arrows that you see on this slide that I've been talking about, those red, red arrows represent the, self, the self-willed opinions of the cults and their leaders who demand that others obey, who demand that others obey their invented doctrines in order to be saved. It's that simple, folks. When sanctification, a process that begins after salvation and justification, a one-time event, are confused, when that happens, it takes away from the sheer spectacle of the cross and it robs the Christian of the sure foundation 
which they are to build upon. The Church of Christ, the Seventh-day Adventists, and the International Church of Christ front load the gospel with works, the red arrows there, which can only be done after salvation. They require the completion of these works in order to qualify to get saved. This is putting the cart before the horse. Again, the cults will sometimes lay claim to believing in full atonement in their official statements. Hey, we're all in, and we believe that you're saved by grace through faith apart from works. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, this is when they put their little orthodox cap on and really look they're on their best behavior. Go ahead and win you over. So they might say that in their official statements of beliefs, only to turn around and practice limited atonement and works righteousness by requiring works as a precondition to salvation. These contradictions are hypocritical. Alexander Campbell's, quote, but something more is necessary, end of quote, beyond faith, he said, is seen in this slide. So Campbell said, hey man, faith is, a, is cool, but something more is necessary. Man, okay, well, that's what this slide shows. Something more beyond faith and trust in Jesus Christ is necessary. That's what this sh uh, slide shows. The Restoration Movement and Restorationism cults all teach in their doctrine that salvation must require some effort on man's part. Again, they run over to James 2, 14 through 24, directed to the saved and apply it and direct it to the lost. They take James out of context. This is a serious error, a serious heresy, a serious ramification. Anyhow, the restoration movements, they all teach in their doctrine that salvation must require some effort on man's part, as I was saying. Sorry for the repetition. The Roman Catholic Church teaches the same. Well, where does it end? How many good works must be obeyed to receive salvation? Baptism, Sabbath keeping, snake handling, headdresses, singing pledges, uh, singing and pledges and signing pledges, excuse me. First law of pardon, visible faith, visible repentance. Yeah, okay. Okay, so here's their man. They love, the cults love Pelagius. He's their guy. I, I, Pelagius, he'd be cool. All right, so cults disrupt, damage, and alter the gospel. Now, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said, I'm come, I've come, that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Jesus is all we need. Colossians 2.10, there's nothing else that's needed. It's Jesus. And Peter said, well, his word has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Well, if Jesus is all we need and we're full in Christ, our cup is full and to the brim, and God's word covers everything else, and we have the Holy Spirit and grace, well, then why do we need to turn to front-loading works into the gospel? And the cult members should ask themselves that. Okay, so cults disrupt, damage, and alter the gospel. Topic of this slide, the relationship of faith and works or the relationship between faith and works and justification. That's what we're talking about. Salvation, not guilty, but righteous. So justification is a fancy word for salvation. And it's that aspect of the not guilty, but righteous that we're gonna talk about. Okay, first bullet point, the restoration movement and restorationism cults are under the impression that Protestants and evangelicals have no part for works in the salvation formula. Well, this is simply incorrect. And they'll slur these groups to no end and uh, disparage them, tear them down, and erect all kinds of straw man arguments. It shows you that they really um, cannot defend their theology. That's why they come up with all of these arguments. Anyhow, there's the star. This is really important, that first check mark. The evangelical understanding is that, um, again, these are salvation formulas. Grace equals salvation plus works. Works come after the grace and the salvation. Pseudo-Christianity's interpretation is either grace plus works equals salvation. That's semi-Pelagian 
or works equals salvation plus grace. That's full Pelagian. Note, the equal sign in these formulas means leads to or results in. So as I was saying, here's the two salvation models. Um, Pseudo-Christianity uh, has a heretical, uh, false man-centered gospel and salvation. Very clearly, you can see they put works right up there, and they mix a little grace in there. But only if you do that does it equal salvation. Well, you've just devalued the atonement, made a mockery of the cross, and slipped into pseudo-Christianity, uh, where you will live a life of cursedness until you repent and trust in Christ fully and bite down on grace. Swallow it whole. Some uh, comments here as we say goodbye to Pelagius, a heretic. Uh, I believe he lived, uh, lived in the three or four hundreds AD, maybe five hundreds. Some comments. The pseudo-Christian formula for salvation is a view held by the Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of, uh, Churches of Christ, and the International Churches of Christ. This is also the viewpoint held out by Roman Catholic justification theology. We covered that in part 10 and 11 of this series. Their theology is semi-Pelagian, salvation by works plus God's grace, or even full Pelagian. In theological discussions, this is also known as a blended or merged gospel of mixing legalism with grace. So if you say, hey man, that's a, you know, this Pelagian kind of type of stuff is a little too nerdy for me. Well, the error here is blending or, or merging the gospel, a blended or merged gospel, which is mixing legalism and grace for salvation. The view of grace showcased in this salvation formula is shared among the Latter-day Saints, Mormons, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, as well as the Restoration Movement cults, or Restoration, all of them, okay? So do you want to be in that company? I hope not. Okay, moving. All right, second, uh, near the end here. I really like this slide. Here's a, a poem. It looks uh, to be, uh, I don't know, maybe a fifth or sixth grader. It says, you're my ball and chain. I try to run. You're quick to follow. You've caused so much pain. There's no escaping your heavy burden, for you are my ball and chain. Fruitless efforts to struggle and fight, they only worsen the pain. I try and try with all my might, and yet it happens again and again. No matter what I try to do, there's no escaping my ball and chain. And here, here, it's a spiritual picture because I, as I've already made clear, some people are super puffed up about their works and they're happy and just really doing well. They, they have a lot of abilities and they have a cult personality that already uh, is favored by the group, bubbly and outgoing. And so they're not down in the dumps like this. But really and truly, this is a spiritual matter. This is about demonic oppression here. So um, try to envision uh, the spiritual realities of enslavement and religious captivation. Be sure and review part five, those two slides there. I love the chasing of the carrot. Uh, and then part 11, we talked about the three responses uh, to grace. Salvation and sanctification embrace grace. Swallow it whole, Titus 2, 11 through 14. Okay, so here we have the Church of Christ, saved by works, legalistic patternism, baptism, and rule keeping. So that's their ball and chain. That's their heavy burden. The Adventists, well, saved by Sabbath keeping, dietary restrictions, honoring the prophecies of Ellen G. White, and on and on. Well, the Inter International Churches of Christ, and they're going to put a whooping on everyone because they're just going to even outperform even the elites. Saved by works, discipleship criteria, criteria baptism, rule keeping, and keeping quiet about the doctrine, and on and on and on. Bible response, mankind is saved apart from any moral achievements or religious acts on our behalf. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Romans 3, 24 and 28. Okay, some comments. Great emphasis is laid upon the teaching that the Sabbath day is on Saturday. So this is uh, apparently uh, talking about Adventism. 
They, they just love the Sabbath keep, keeping and Saturday rule. And if a person does not keep Saturday as the Sabbath, well, he can't be saved. Ultimately, according to Seventh-day Adventist theology, your salvation in the last days boils down to the day you worship on. Okay. Simply put, there is no salvation outside the Seventh-day Adventist church. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith and nothing more. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and again, many others. This text is the gospel in a nutshell, and saved by grace through faith is a major passage that helps us to understand God's grace. The term salvation in this passage, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, reflects a completed action with emphasis on its present effects. End of quote. And that's the 1984 Zondervan Study Bible Notes that I just took out of my Bible and put on there. So it's not just past tense salvation. We were saved. It's present tense ongoing reality. We're saved by grace through faith. So we're not just saved past tense by grace, as I was saying, and then it's up to us to save ourselves. No, presently we are being saved as a grace as well. Cults are totalistic in that one never knows they are saved. Well, how many works are enough? This shifting standard will kill any chances of joyous and victorious Christian living. Your best efforts will be ineffective at best and will not glorify God as he intended. It even says it in the poem. That fifth or sixth graders even understand that. Recall the three grace responses we covered in part 11. Salvation is by grace, but you must swallow grace whole. It's a gift. God appropriates salvation by faith alone. That's an essential Christian doctrine on salvation. Obedience is not the basis of why a believer is right with God. No works are the ground of our justification. Here's the point of this slide. The heresy of conditionalism is giving the devil a foothold. Again, I told you, it's best to look at this picture in terms of demonic oppression and uh, a, 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 an unseen malevolent force in the life of a cultist. Okay, It's the heresy of conditionalism that's giving a devil a foothold and a stronghold. Pride is resisting grace. What else is the ultimate truth in your life? Baptismal justification, keeping the sacraments, five-finger plan of salvation, Sabbath keeping and dietary law, discipleship criteria, maybe the teachings of uh, Kip McKean, confession, attendance, tithing as 10%, who knows? Are you trusting a system of man-made doctrines for salvation rather than trusting the Lord Jesus himself? Remember, these 19th century cults all came online in the 1800s. Well, that ought to give you some pause there. They say, oh, well, geez, the church went apostate and we discovered it. Okay, red flags should go up. Uh, Campbellstone Scott Churches of Christ. Well, they restored the church in 1811, they said, but then also made, discovered the, the ancient gospel and five-finger plan of salvation in 1823 and then implemented it just four years later. You ought to really, the red flags ought to go up big time on that one. Okay. First Peter 5, 10 through 12. The apostle Peter told the church, to stand fast in God's grace and that this was the true grace. Are you trusting in God's gracious provision in Christ or are you attempting to be like God through your own efforts? Are you trusting in your church's holiness crutches, which is my way religion? What is the part of you that wants to be like God by doing things your way? That's the very thing that has taken you captive and stole your joy. Okay, I think we can move on from this. Okay. So here's a quote from Warren Dowd. He's the founder of Grace Notes. That looks to be him and his wife. And I like him pointing. It's you, 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 maybe he's saying. 
Yes, grace is for you. What a what a neat man, and I've uh, really benefited from his. Um, it's really an article called Legalism. He wrote it in 2017. And again, he's the founder of Grace Notes. It's an online tra uh, training, a Bible teaching program. You can reach him at wdowd at gracenotes.info if you like. And here, here he is, works righteousness delusion. Again, the cults have rejected faith righteousness. They haven't learned from Israel's mistake. Uh, Romans 10 Verses two through four. No, they they are too busy uh, and fallen. They've fallen in love with their own commitments. So here is works righteousness. That's the only other option. And here's the way of the cultist. Quote: The very thing that the legalist puts himself under is that which rises up to smite him. When a Christian puts himself under the taboos of others, he can't measure up. So he puts himself under a church organization and he still cannot measure up. The very system that he embraces proves him to be deficient by always presenting a moving target. Here's the kicker. Grace is the only system which does not magnify the believer's deficiencies. End of quote, war and doubt. And we cannot mix, merge, or blend grace with law keeping. It's one or the other. You're a works righteousness person or you're a faith righteousness person. I hope it's the latter and not the former. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, that which you rely on, all those front loaded things that we talked about from uh, Dr. Robert Moray's Rise of the Cults video those red arrows, all that which you rely on. And you have to rely on that in the cults. They teach you that in their catechism. <laughs> Can't tell me that you're not relying on those things. Oh, I did those things because I was dis uh, because I was obedient. And I was just, no, stop it. Stop it. These are not Bible teachings. And the Bible does not teach performance in order to obtain salvation. That which you, that which you rely on, you become a slave to. Romans 6, 16 through 18. Okay, so there we have it. And we've got all the things that the cultist places their trust and their weight and their faith in. Confession, discipleship, patternism. Maybe you're a pre-resurrection Christ model discipleship person uh, following the Kit McKean model. Or maybe you're just into the patternism of Acts 2.42 and you're a Church of Christer. And, you know, well, here, you know, I mean, uh, read your Bible, confess, I can devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking the bread and prayer, and then you've got all these other rules. Maybe you're just a Church of Christer patternism. Next is evangelism, door knocking, maybe cold contact evangelism, tithing as 10%. Maybe those are your bare minimums. Boy, you better do that or you won't be approved by God. You won't be justified. Maybe it's attendance, which some people think church attendance. Uh, it says in Hebrews, right? Don't forsake the meeting, uh, to, you know, together, uh, you know, but encourage one another daily as you see the day approaching. So don't forsake, forsake meeting together, it says in Hebrews. So if you don't go to church regularly, well, God can't really approve of you. You can't really be justified because that's a process, right? Wrong. And church attendance, if that were a legitimate standard of righteousness, well, then what else would it be? And what of those that are too elderly? What of those that have all kinds of immuno uh, deficiencies? They don't go to church, and yet there are many a strong Christian who, who is in that category. Do you see? Where does it end? But the legalists uh, spends all their time judging others and measuring them up themselves, almost like God's uh, self-appointed fruit inspectors. So what is it? Attendance? People-pleasing. That'll take you captive real easy in the cults. Moral conformity? I could tell you I was all of those. Every single one of these, I was one of those as I was a cult member in the International Church of Christ. Okay, um, and uh, people-pleasing and moral conformity is huge. Anyhow, Sabbath keeping, dietary rules, church idolatry, a lot of folks rely on that. Elitism, that's huge in restoration movement 
and Restorationism cults, all 19th century, these cults, they all claim to be the one true church. They all claim to be the only group. So elitism, divisive spirit, they're all divisive and sectarian and sinful. They don't cooperate or get along with others. And religious pride. We talked about uh, flesh versus the spirit. And they're just really enamored with their accomplishments and their supposedly higher order Christianity. So that's the religious pride. And um, that's really sad. Okay, so all biblical obedience stems from faith. Some comments. All biblical obedience stems from faith. Faith is the great essential. Faith must be grounded in the correct set of facts. Facts come first, then faith. Under the new covenant, that faith is based in Christ and in his finished work. Okay, elitist teachings in the church. Excuse me, self-centered religion, a religious system, an ideology, church traditions, or unique doctrine, all take captive and, and enslave. Philosophical snares such as, God helps those who helps themselves, no pain, no gain, and other false ideas such as, I'm justified by faith, plus all the other religious acts that I perform. All these take captive and enslave. So it could be a doctrine, a teaching, an ideology, a philosophical snare. They'll all betray and take you captive. Those who live like this cannot please God. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under law, Galatians 5.18, Romans 8.14. However, if you, continue, if you continue to live under this equitable exchange or this for that faithless paradigm, you will fall under God's judgment, Galatians 5.19 through 21. The Galatians sin list is specifically tailored to the sin of Galatianism, which is the sinful nature of wanting to boast and be elitist and be sectarian and do all the things that we've talked about in this entire series. It's the legalist. Much more could be said about these holiness crutches and the nearly invisible web of religious captivation of the cults and their subtle deceitful doctrines. But that's it on the topic of American cult Christianity part 14 and why there are so many strange American cults today. Thank you for viewing and be sure to check out my website and ebook series on the International Church of Christ at www.sparrowministry.com or order the books directly from amazon.com or my amazon.com author page. They're also available on Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Rakuten, and many electronic libraries. If you don't have a Kindle device, no problem. The website has other formats that will work on your PC, smartphone, and tablet.